We're going to look at decision trees. We'll look at uh, what they are. We'll look at a learning algorithm for building decision trees. Then we'll talk about some sort of a practice, some sort of practical issues involving decision trees. Um, the, your first homework will involve you implementing the decision tree learning algorithm. My hope is in today's lecture, I'll finish the part on the representation of what decision trees are. And uh, on Thursday, we'll go over uh, a learning algorithm called ID3, which is uh, from the 1970s or something. Uh, and most decision tree learning algorithms are essentially variants of that. And uh, we'll see how far we go with that. So uh, as we go along, not just here, uh, not just for decision trees, for decision trees, for um, linear models, for anything that we encounter in class, we should keep in mind a few different um, points of view, a few perspectives. The first one is how do you convert your your problem into a learning problem? When I say your problem, your problem could be uh, you know for assigning labels to the to the, to the names. Or it could be detecting whether an image has a uh, has a cat in it or not. How do you convert that into a machine learning problem? Now that may seem like it's fairly easy because somebody has given you a data set and then you just throw a learning algorithm at it. But that's not how it actually that's not how it always works. Imagine that you're going to go to a um, you're going to work in some company and someone who's not technically oriented comes and says, "Hey, I know that you are an expert on machine learning." Um, can you somehow figure out, help me figure out uh, how, whether our customers actually like the marketing emails we send them or not? Use whatever you want with machine learning and figure that out. You don't have data, you just have a question. So something to keep in mind through the entire semester is how do we convert these kinds of high level questions into something that is more focused? What kinds of, uh, how do we represent data? How do we employ algorithms on them? And eventually, when we convert it into a learning problem, what learning protocol will we use? We are only looking at supervised learning, which says collect all the data that you can and then toss it into this uh, black box that does some work. But there are other learning protocols. Maybe you want to interactively ask people whether they like the marketing email, or maybe you want to uh, do something else. So there are other learning protocols. Uh, there are two questions related to the general theme of representation. One of them involves how do you represent inputs? How do you represent uh, uh, the inputs in a feature space? It's not always an obvious uh, answer of how you might do that. In, to the point where I think I was mentioning this to someone after class the other day, perhaps the biggest advance in machine learning in the last maybe 15 years comes from the recognition that uh, discuss, inventing Good features manually is very, very hard. <clears throat> Instead, let's make that into a learning problem. And so the one of the biggest new, well, not new anymore, but one of the biggest conferences in machine learning is called uh, the International Conference on Learning Representation. It's all about learning representation. And you may have heard of uh, deep neural networks. That's not, nothing but essentially that idea, where representations are learned. That's one um, type of representation issue that you have to think about. Another representation is how are your functions represented? Are your functions um, uh, M of N rule or are they conjunctions? Are they these neural networks? And these two functions, these two questions are not really independent of each other, it turns out. But these are two perspectives that are worth keeping in mind. And since we are in a CS uh, context, the question of what algorithm always needs to be at the top of your mind as well. What is the learning algorithm that we are going to employ? What makes the learning algorithm good? Um, how do you define success? How do you evaluate the performance of a learning algorithm? And of course, the, the computational question is, how long will learning take? If I give you a data set with n uh, examples, and I also give you a learning algorithm, and I tell you, don't worry, this will get you the right answer, or the best answer that we can possibly squeeze out of this n example. It may take an exponential amount of time in N, but don't worry, it'll work. Probably not a great algorithm. <laughs> so you want an efficient learning algorithm. So uh, all of these questions are worth keeping in mind. And uh, for every new 
hypothesis phase that we encounter for every new learning algorithm we encounter, you should ask yourself, what is the expressiveness of this class of functions? <laughs> what kinds of mathematical functions can it, uh, what's the restriction it places on the hypothesis phase? And the second one is, if I show you a learning algorithm, you should ask yourself, how efficient is this? Um, it's a very practical question, it turns out, because uh, most of the learning algorithms we see in class, you'll implement for your homeworks. So the efficiency thing becomes a big issue. Um, if you implement things not too, not too well, you might end up taking more than the two weeks that's there for the homework. So, you know, there's a practical uh, two week perspective. Any questions about <laughs> this, this high level thing? <laughs> Coming up for the rest of the semester, we'll be looking at different hypothesis spaces and different learning algorithms. We look at decision trees right now and the ID3 algorithm on, the, on Thursday. And then we look at different types of uh, algorithms for learning linear classifiers. Uh, three of them, in fact, are Poseptron, SVM, and logistic regression. All of them are essentially learning algorithms that operate on the same hypothesis space, but they make different assumptions about the data and the functions. Um, and when we combine different classifiers, we are just creating larger functions. We are just creating a larger hypothesis space. And that also gives us new hypothesis spaces and new kinds of learning algorithms. We'll be looking at an algorithm called Adaboost, which is a good representative of something called boosting. And we look at bagging, which is just this idea of combining multiple uh, trees. We look at nonlinear classifiers, which is just a, um, you know, nonlinear classifiers is not a, a well defined class. It's like saying the world is full of potatoes and non potatoes. Yeah. Technically true. Um, but uh, nonlinear classifiers, the specific thing we look at will be uh, neural networks. And neural networks are essentially this constructive mechanism for creating large families of models. And uh, we look at nearest neighbors, which also makes its own assumptions about the hypothesis phase. And each of these come with their own learning art. Okay, this is just uh, um, sort of a plan for the entire semester. My hope is by the end of the semester, you would have implemented many of these things for your homeworks. And of course, in each of these cases, you should ask yourself, what do these functions represent? What are the assumptions? How do these functions allow generalization? And how does learning work? This unit is all about decision trees. There are three questions. The first one is, or there are three sub parts. First one is uh, about what are decision trees? It's the representation question. What function is the decision tree? The second one is how do we learn decision trees? That's the learning question. And in particular, we'll be looking at a greedy heuristic called ID3. ID3 stands for iterative dichotomizer tree. Um, don't ask me anything more beyond about the name. Uh, and we'll look at some practical extensions of the ID3 algorithm and uh, um, we'll wrap it up from there. Let's talk about decision trees and what they represent. How many people have seen decision trees before? Many people are raising their hands, but only half raising their hands. Um, okay, one person has definitely seen it. Okay. Let me start off uh, by talking about how we might represent data. This is the data that we saw for the badges game. And uh, you know, data can be represented as a big table. So different, uh, it's a, it, this is how databases function. We have uh, columns for each uh, feature, each attribute you have, like name and label, and you can fill up a database. Completely fine, this is what uh, you learn how to do in databases. Alternatively, data can be represented as a big table, but rather than representing the raw data directly, namely the names, you have features in each column. So I have a feature, uh, the second character of the first name, and for your prime, it's an O. And if I do this, and if I toss this up, if I, I can maybe, once I have this, I can toss out the name uh, column entirely. I could, not saying I should, but I could. Something to think about. If I only keep these middle four um, columns, with those four attributes, how many unique rows are possible? Let's assume that we have only lowercase letters and, uh, and 
این اصل Some of you are murmuring answers. If you know the answer, just raise your hand. Yes. That's right. So you have this, this column has two entries. This one has two entries. This one has two possible entries. And this has 36. And every possible combination of those two of these three could be a row in this table. And every one of those rows could be associated with a label. So you have 208 possible um, unique rows. That's great. Now, importantly, you have only 208 possible unique rows. Instead, had we stored every possible name, in theory, the number of possible unique rows is infinite. So any pair of strings could be a first name and a last name. Not saying that they are necessarily pronounceable, but yeah. But have you have we made any progress by moving to this uh, two hundred eight row table? Yes. Yes. And that seems like an efficiency. Um, Okay. In fact, we also don't need to store, you, it just is an easier way to store the data. Assuming, of course, that these are the only four relevant things. If you keep the, only these four things and it turns out there's a hook feature that you need to compute, you're out of luck. But uh, instead, of two, instead of these four things, let's say you have 100 attributes, all of them are Boolean. How many unique rows would there be? Two power 100. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, that doesn't look too good. 2 power 100 is huge. So even though it seemed like 208 was an efficient way to store the data, 2 power 100 was no longer uh, efficient. So rather than thinking about learning and such things, what if you had to store, you just had to store the data efficiently. Storing every row could be very inefficient. And so let's just, rather than thinking about any learning uh, questions, you can ask, how do you represent this data in a more efficient way? And one answer involves a decision tree. It's a hierarchical data structure that uh, represents the data using a divided functor type strategy. So just so happens that it can be used as a hypothesis class as well, um, where the goal is to learn one of these data structures. Let's look at an example rather than, uh, uh, let me formally define what are the decision trees and then walk you through an example. Uh, from our point of view, a decision tree is a family of classifiers that are uh, for, the in, for the cases where instances are represented by uh, uh, discrete attributes, like basically features, every node in the tree, every interior node in the tree represents a test for a feature. Does this feature have this value or that value? And every edge you take the you answer the question and you take the edge for which the answer holds and you keep going down to the leaf of the tree and the leaf represents a label. If you've not seen this before, what I just described seems very vague. So let me present an example. Let's say we want to build a decision tree for classifying these shapes. Um, I'll give you um, I'll, I'll walk you through this process of building a decision tree here. But even before we build any tree, here we have three we have uh, shapes with different colors, and they have different labels. So we have A, B, and C. Can someone guess what the label of a red triangle would be here? Yes. Mm -hmm. And why? Right. Isn't that amazing? You just generalize, even though there is no red triangle in the data, you've made a generalization. So it would be nice if you have a classifier that can also do that. Let's build a decision tree. So the, to start off this process, we need to think about features. What might some features be for this data? Shape and color. That's a good choice because uh, that's exactly what I have here. Uh, but you realize that's not necessarily the only choice that's, that's possible. For example, one particular thing could be 
what is the RGB value of this segment? What's the RGB value of this segment? What's the RGB value of this segment? So you can basically just break down the shape into pieces and collect a big set of vectors, uh, a big set of numbers. Or you could put a box around the shape and like consider RGB values for each box here. It can be crazy. So you can do all sorts of things, but shape and color are a good choice because uh, uh, it's uh, what the slide says. So it must be correct. <laughs> So to build a decision tree, every node is a test for a feature. So let's say we start off this, this tree with the root being the color. So with this particular thing, there are three choices. You have blue, red, and green. Each value that that feature can take becomes an outgoing edge. And now we have, we need to put something here. <coughs> So let's consider the case where the color is red. All red things seem to be here. So we don't even need to do any more branching. If the color is red, the label is weak. We're done. If the color is blue, then we start looking at the shape. If the color is blue and the shape's a triangle, the label is a B. If it's a square, it's an A. The circle is a C. Similarly, if the color is green, and the shape is a square, it's a B, it's a circle, it's an A. What I've done here is I've built a decision tree. Every interior node, the boxes here, represent a test for a feature. Every path represents a value that that particular, every edge, sorry, represents a value that that feature can take. And every lead represents a label. Now, given a new instance, for example, a red triangle, we can, there are no red triangles in the data, but we can ask the decision tree, what's the label for a red triangle? And we can go through this process from the top. What's the colors? It's red. Done. The labels are B. So we essentially build a classifier that assigns a label for unseen examples. I've not told you what the learning algorithm is. I just decided to choose the color node at the top. Yes. That's an excellent question. What would you do with a green triangle? So we already we've covered the red triangle part. Just follow the path from the what would you do with the green triangle? In this case, it turns out that uh, there's a bug in the code. The green triangle does not show up here. Really, we need to have covered every possible shape. We need to put a triangle here and we need to decide some way to label things that are not shown in the data. You could, for instance, say the green triangle is going to get the label that's most common among green things. Or it could be the label that's most common among triangular things. Or some other choice. Or you could say, I don't have a green triangle in the data. Anything that's not in the data gets a label minus or gets the label B. These are all choices that you make, but you have to make an assumption. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, because we don't have to repeat uh, certain things multiple times. So the color uh, shows up only once in this case. So you don't say blue triangle, Blue square, blue circle, you just say blue once and then triangle, square, circle. That's it. And as the tree gets bigger and bigger, the savings get uh, more and more. That's literally what there is. I know. It's a little, I'll go to you and then. Hierarchy of what? Uh, you mean an order in which I enumerate the feature? Good question. So the question is, does this mean that there's going to be a certain order in which I need to use the features to build the tree? And the answer is, in fact, it turns out the decision tree learning algorithm actually does that. That's the only thing the decision tree learning algorithm does. It says, what's the next feature that I need to split the data? And you keep recursively doing that again and again, you split the entire data. Uh, there's a question here. Yes. Yeah. 
Ah, so what if you had a blue circle in A and C? In fact, let's do that because, so well, let's say these are none of these are circles, but I'm glad not, nobody's complaining. So what if you had a blue circle in A and in C? This kind of a data set is no longer consistent with respect to the features that we have. This means one of two things. Either the features we have are insufficient or the data has not. You want to hear what the bad news is? It's hard to tell which one is it. Um, you can, and but the good news is in both cases, the answer is the same. We make an assumption. Um, we, in this case, we have to live with the, uh, you know, the, for instance, here what I might do is I note that here uh, the label blue circles have a label C, and a majority of blue circles are on the C side than in the A side. So I go for the majority. So because in the future, data will behave in the same way. So there will be more circles in C than in A. So my, my uh, classifier will make fewer errors. Yes, unique feature combination for now. In real life, that's not guaranteed to happen. In which case, we have to live with the app. Other questions? So, so that's what decision trees are. I mean, decision trees are very simple, uh, sort of rules that uh, you check at every position uh, you check a feature and then follow the tree down to get to a name question yes it will give you a structurally different tree every choice of you know, that's a very good observation i could have created a different tree where i started it with shape on top and color below Rather than me telling you whether it gives you a different tree, I encourage you to actually create that. Create the tree and see what happens. The interesting thing is not whether it gives you the same labels on the data that's observed. Will it give different labels on future data points? Can you come up with an example where the two choices will give different labels? That's the interesting question. And if it does, then how do you know which one's the right one? You have to make an assumption. In this case, you're not making an assumption. It turns out that your learning algorithm is going to make a choice of picking a certain feature. And that goes back to the earlier question. How do you know which feature to split on? And that's the only choice that the ID3 algorithm actually makes. So we just looked at a new hypothesis space. It's the set of all possible decision trees. Now, what kind of functions can all possible decision trees represent? The answer is any Boolean function can be written as a decision tree. Every Boolean function can be converted into a decision tree. Let me give you a simple example. So let's say you have um, x1 and x3 that came up earlier today. I can write this as a tree as x1. If this is, it's a Boolean, it's either true or false. If it's true, then I check for x3. x3 can be true or false, false or true. If both of them are true, then the label is one. Otherwise, the label is zero. I've converted my uh, Boolean function into a decision tree. Any Boolean function can be represented as a decision tree, which means the set of all possible decision trees includes the set of all possible Boolean functions. That's good news and bad news. Good news because it's a well understood set of functions. It's bad news because it's a huge set of functions. We've done nothing to prevent that explosion of the hypothesis space. If we had 16, if we had four possible features, we still have two power 16 possible functions. So we've done nothing to prevent the explosion of hypothesis space. That's fine. We'll, live, we'll come, come to that part later. You can also convert any decision tree into this sort of a set of rules. And this is one of the reasons why decision trees kind of are worth having in your toolkit. These sorts of rules are easier to understand for people than any other sort of a, any other output of a machine learning system. 
So I can write a rule that says, if the color is blue and the shape is a triangle, the label to be as followed down this path. Or if the color is green and the label and the, and the shape is a square, then the label be. Every path from the root all the way to the leaf gives you a different um, uh, chain of uh, reasoning for why the label is what it is. And suddenly, the, this, this sort of set of rules becomes more interpretable for people who may not be necessarily uh, well versed in high dimensional geometry. And apparently, not everyone is. I know. Any Boolean function can be represented as a decision tree, and that's something that's worth uh, knowing. The output has to be discrete categories in the example that we saw, but it turns out that there are extensions of this framework that allows for regression also. Regression is where the output's a real number. To make uh, the output a real number, the leaf, instead of being just a, uh, a single a discrete label, the leaf I think, can be a function that produces, that computes the label. And uh, that gives you, uh, that, that allows you to do regression traits. There are, it's very well studied in the literature. There are standard techniques, some of which we'll encounter later for handling noisy data, for handling the case where some features are missing because some uh, column got deleted maybe or something. And uh, we'll look at more of this uh, as we go along. One thing that's also worth thinking about is what do you do when your features are not uh, discrete, but when they are real numbers? In the examples that we saw, the features were discrete. So you had shape and color. There were uh, three shapes and uh, two colors. So you could just have one path for everything. What do you do if you have a discrete feature? For example, length or say height or something like that. Any ideas? What could you do with discrete features? Yes. So you are thresholding it at a certain value. That's one option. Other ideas? Yes. That's the other, uh, that's the generalization of this idea. The N equals two gives you this. You have multiple bins and every bin becomes one path that you take one uh, out of the node. Other thoughts? Yes. What do you do with it? The pro uh, that's a very, that's, that's like a natural question. So let's, uh, we have length. And you say 15. Then it's a plus. It's 15.1. Then it's a minus. So if it's 15.05, then it's a plus. 15.001, then it's a minus. The problem with doing this is there's an infinite number of them. There's an uncountably infinite number of them, and so this will never end. So the one thing that you can't do is have exact values because of that problem. In fact, the standard thing to do is just to discretize the data. The standard thing to do is just threshold uh, the real numbers. And then the question is, how do you find the threshold? There are standard heuristics. You can use, we can talk about that uh, maybe to do some homework type questions. So here's an example. Let's say that you have a data set where you have uh, pluses and minuses distributed that way. You have two features. There's a feature called X. And for some reason, I've used Y as a feature here. Um, and you have the point. I can discretize this as when X is less than three. So X is less than three, so it's here on this side. <coughs> I first check for that, and then I check if y is less than seven or y is greater than seven. I check this side, and here it's all a plus, and so on. So I'm basically breaking, I'm putting these uh, boundaries along the way. It doesn't have to be discretized with axis parallel lines, it could be discretized in more complicated ways. Also, the interesting thing is by doing this, you get decision boundaries between the pluses and the minuses that could be non linear. Decision trees can support nonlinear uh, decision boundaries. This is not a, a single line. 
Uh, at this point, we've not encountered linear classifiers, which may just seem like uh, a technical point, but it turns out that this is uh, this is for other reasons. Yes. I don't know if it's relevant anymore. Not, but is this like a linear subject problem? It's not. It's, it's definitely it's more than that. Because of this reason. So let's quickly summarize. Um, the decision trees are a data structure that can represent any Boolean function. And in fact, it's sort of a useful mental exercise to take any Boolean function and convert it into a decision tree. Maybe your homework will make you do that. Um, uh, it, it's, an, it's a way to represent a lot of data in a somewhat compact way. As you pointed out, it may not be super compact, but it's better than representing your full data. Um, one sort of a useful mental model to think about making predictions with decision trees is playing 20 questions. Um, every time you ask a question, you are cutting down the set of possible things that can happen. You ask a question, you go down a path, you ask a question, till you arrive at an answer. So as a result, prediction with the decision tree is easy and has a natural sort of a, a feel to it. Um, and there's a thing about, you know, given a single data set, many decision trees can represent, many structurally different decision trees can represent it. I think you brought up a point. Think about that more generally. It's worth knowing that. Um, the next question is, uh, how do we learn? Given a data set, so far all I've shown you is, what is a decision tree? Next question is, given a data set, how do we grow a decision tree? That will be the focus of our next lecture. Um, as you, uh, uh, If there are questions, I'll take them now, uh, but I also wanted to point out a couple of exercises for you to play with. Uh, um, for the, the shared data that's here, rather than creating a tree where the root is a color and then you have shape, I encourage you to think about um, having a case where the root is shape and the color comes after and think about whether these two trees will give you the same name. In fact, try to come up with an example where these two trees will give different names because they do make different choices. And uh, more, if you want to generalize that, it's so that there are multiple structurally different trees that can represent the same Boolean functions. I'll be happy to take questions at this point. We have a couple of minutes, I think, but uh, um, I'll take questions or we can wrap up. I have office hours. If you feel like uh, you want to chat, you can talk, talk in my office hours as well.